Well, good evening, everyone, or afternoon, or whatever you're listening to this. Um, welcome back to Talk to Toe. I'm your host, Chris Toe. Um, be sure to like and subscribe, give us that rating on iTunes, and share it to your friends and family. Once again, this podcast is brought to you by One Broke Grad Student, Free Speech, Curiosity, and Good Conversation in Science. So I'm joined today by my friend and special guest, Ben Bu- <laughs> Belyaf. <Be alive. laughs> it's a tough name. It's a tough last name. Um, ben, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so I guess I should probably just ask you, like, what is the origin of your last name? Yeah, um, it's basically a, a strange conglomeration of Russian and Polish. Okay. So my, um, my name comes from my dad's side, and his uh, family has uh, Russian roots. So Biel uh, is white in, in the Russian language. And we don't really know where the suffix, the, the ayef, comes from. Uh, I think it came somewhere when his uh, ancestors immigrated to Poland. Um, but it, I guess my name would sort of translate to, you know, Mr. White uh, okay. or something like that. But the, the J sounds like a Y, and then the W sounds like a B. So I get a lot of Bialajus. Yeah. Uh, I got a big low ones, <laughs> but, but it's, it would be pronounced Bialajus. Okay, nice. So how did you and your family, I guess, end up in Michigan? Because that's where you're from originally, right? Yeah. Well, well I'm actually, I was born in Canada, oh. in, in uh, Ottawa. And uh, my parents met in, in Canada. And I was uh, born there, but then my dad got a job at the University of Michigan, uh, a professorship. Okay. So we moved down here. I was only uh, one year old, and then I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay, so do you have dual citizenship then? Or? Yeah, I do. Um, so Canadian and American citizenship, although I barely ever used the Canadian citizenship <laughs> for anything. I guess I could have gone to Cuba at some point, but then that got okay with the U.S. passport, so... Yeah, so... Yeah. <laughs> interesting. That's always interesting, because, like... You know, I don't think anyone really knows how that dual citizenship thing works. It's like... I don't really know either. <laughs> like, some people have it, but, like, the U.S. kind of doesn't... I, yeah, the U.S. Person. doesn't recognize it, yeah. but um, I think Canada does, so I am i don't know. Okay, nice. So, you obviously eventually made yourself over here to the mm-hmm. West Coast. Um, I guess since you've been here a couple of years, like, what do you say is, like, the biggest differences between Michigan and California, I guess, in general? Because you've... Does some traveling around California yeah, at this point? Yeah, I guess um, the, the easy answer is, is the weather. <laughs> <laughs> um, Midwest winters are rough. Um, but also, kind of culturally, I, I really like the diversity out here. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan is uh, like pretty much predominantly white, and it's um, definitely not the case out here. Like You see mm-hmm. a lot of... Um, like. Latino culture especially like there's I mean there's a lot of you know especially Chinese immigrants like Mm -hmm. at UCI because you know UC school and everything but yeah they're particularly another mine yeah yeah um but there's there's definitely a little bit uh more of a melting pot I guess in Southern California as opposed to most parts of the Midwest which is is something that's pretty nice um I really like especially food wise I like to, (laughs) to eat a lot of different you know cultural food and stuff like that so that's good for me okay so like what is what is the best thing they've eaten so far out here it's probably hard to choose uh, more, yeah right? it's, it's really hard to choose I, th- I think the taco trucks in santa Ana are super good that's true um, yeah the the pho in westminster um is super good as well and i mean did tai Fong has yeah like, actually i think i'm going to get some uh spring rolls in garden grove okay yeah yeah tomorrow so i'll let you know how those are for sure Spring rolls are pretty good too. Yeah, there's area. there's this one place that has like a crab, shrimp, and pork soup. I, we actually went there. Oh yeah, the, like on the way to the yeah, to the, the my, car dealership. My fun, my fun, yeah. Yeah. Um, their soup's so good. Yeah, I would definitely go back there again. But they're always out. Like, well, it's so good that people buy them out. I guess. I know. Every day. <laughs> Let's get there early, otherwise, because yeah. we went there at what like. We went two? there yeah afternoon, and they were. You probably have to go like early for lunch, or else you know they're they're sold out. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That's how you know a place is good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> nice. So, I guess you're also in Dr. Athanasio's lab. Yep, right? same as Ryan. And um, you are studying articular cartilage of the knee. Right. Um, so, how did you get interested in cartilage in general? Like, did you have any background in it in undergrad? Because um, you went to the University of Michigan, right. correct? Um so yeah, how'd you get interested in that? How'd you end up in Dr. Athanasio's lab? Yeah, so my lab in, um, in undergrad, I was working for a professor named Dave Cohn, and he does a lot of research on bone. Okay. Um, so 
my uh, grad students and I would play cells um, like mesenchymal kind, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, the kind which differentiate into bone. Okay. And we would like do some tests on them, see you know what affected their differentiation. We also studied collagen, which is like one of the proteins that makes up bone. Um, and when I was coming out here for interviews, I was interested in a few different labs, uh, like Tim Downing's. Um, I was interested in Wendy Liu's. And I had interviews, you know, with those professors. Their research sounded interesting, but there wasn't a whole lot from my undergrad experience that I could apply uh, mm -hmm. to their work. So you were really looking to still be able to like use skills that you learned. Yeah, I, I I was always really interested in tissue engineering. Okay. Um, and as soon as I started talking to um, Jerry Hugh, who is Dr. A's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of right hand guy, and then uh, Wendy Brown, who's a postdoc in our lab, um, I interviewed with them. And it was like instantly we were, we were speaking the same language because um, I had that background um, with kind of the tissue engineering side of things, but also a bunch of the, you know, biochemistry of bone and cartilage is really, really similar. So all the assays, you know, all the, the tests that I'm used to running in lab mm -hmm. um, are the exact same. And I could look kind of at their papers or at their posters and instantly kind of know what they were talking about. Uh, which you can't really do with labs that you're not familiar with. Yeah, it's a lot more difficult to do that. You right. Have to, yeah, because it, it's weird because there is a lot of terms that are very lab specific and mm -hmm. even when you're reading papers in the same field, sometimes you don't know what they're talking about because right. they use different, uh, I guess, assays. But I guess like for people who don't really know what... Let's, maybe let's start with uh, like the, the stem cells. Sure. So like... Um, when you're talking about stem cells, um, you're using the mesenchymal stem cells, yeah. and that's kind of a fancy way of saying bone. Yeah, stem it's, cells it's that will eventually the bone, bone lineage. Yeah. Um, um, so where did you guys get those, and like, what was the process of using that in an experiment? Yeah. So when I was again, this is all my undergrad work. Uh, we were using mouse uh, mesenchymal stem cells. It was a. It was um, called a. Uh, what, what's the like mortal line when it's a, a type of cell that's been used over and over again? Yeah, the mortalized yeah. line. Yeah, a mortalized line. Uh, so this one is called MC3T3. Um, very, you know, well studied. Um, but it, it was a mouse calvarium based cell. Uh, and we basically would play them out, use, use different growth factors to uh, try to differentiate them into bone. And then we would look at how they start producing uh, extracellular matrix or the stuff that really makes up the tissues of your body. So um, yes, yeah, so you guys are trying to like, I guess, direct how the cells grow because they, they don't start out as bone. Right. But they, the angles try to get them to Yeah, they start out as squishy cells and you need to give them like the right food to and the right growth factors to kind of turn them into what you want. Mm -hmm. And then they start to secrete uh, matrix and start to really make up like the organic bone, um, you know, matrix that, that makes bone tough. Okay. Uh, which is why it's so important. So how, um, how did that process take? Uh, a typical cell culture experiment in that lab would be maybe three weeks. Okay. Yeah, so, so it does take quite a bit of time for those cells to deposit matrix. What's kind of interesting about stem cells is that now that I'm in a cartilage lab, we can't really use stem cells anymore mm -hmm. uh, because if you think about the kind of lifetime of a mesenchymal stem cell, um, it, it starts out with a bunch of differentiation capacity, and then it kind of turns into a cartilage cell, which then turns into a bone cell. Um, because, you know, when you're, when you're developing as a fetus, um, you go through this process called like endochondral ossification, where your bones are all made of cartilage, and then certain uh, cell differentiation pathways happen that turns some of that cartilage into bone. Mm -hmm. so, so stem cells kind of want to pass through uh, the cartilage pathway and end up as bone and that's what we see actually in our lab if we start from stem cells is that I see. They'll start mineralizing right so they'll, they'll we'll start to tissue engineer bone instead of cartilage uh, Which which isn't good for so the difficulty is stopping it at cartilage, right? And we we do have some papers that that do use stem cells and I think we've we've figured out some ways to use them uh, but we primarily use just just cartilage cells uh, mm -hmm. to engineer our tissue because we've developed a certain mm -hmm way of taking a very small amount of cartilage cells and expanding it into very many cartilage cells um, and then going through this process we call aggregate redifferentiation uh, to, to sort of turn them back into cells that can now produce cartilage. Right. Uh, so it's, it's really good for our uses and you can get them easily from a small biopsy 
uh, from from a rib or something like that. Um, so you don't need to go through the process of harvesting stem cells. Nice. Okay. So like the stem cells that you guys are using, at least for the mouse ones, like were they uh, induced stem cells or were they like embryonic stem cells? No, they were embryonic. Oh, okay, so yeah. the mouse embryonic stem cells. Right. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, I've I've never done any direct research with with induced uh, pluripotent stem cells or anything like that. I did in my prelim exam have a have a paper about like blastocyst complementation with with iPSCs, which was really interesting. Right. Um, I remember but, you talking about. Yeah, that. but no no hands on experience myself. Okay. It's a really cool area, though. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. It is a little bit of a gray area, too, because there's a lot of back and forth on, like... I mean, I guess for, like, animal studies, like, people have less reservations about it, but obviously mm -hmm. for the human studies, there's a little bit more of a, a gray area and debate ongoing about that. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, well, it's, it's kind of interesting whenever you talk about... Um, well, I guess human stem cells now are are more readily available from kind of more non-invasive procedures mm -hmm. like you can take things like dermal biopsies and and get plenty of stem cells from that um i think a lot of difficulty has to has to come with like the gene editing aspect of it yeah um especially when you get into things like editing the germline people get really uncomfortable yeah um because that, that kind of goes against some some kind of philosophical i guess morals that people have mm -hmm. um of course, these things need to be really verified that there's not going to be off-target effects, that they're going to be, you know, safe and efficacious before they can be used in humans. Yeah. Um, there was that, uh, there is gene editing treatments now for certain cancers, mm -hmm. I think. Specifically the ones that are like, except they're still not, they're still not germline. Which means right. that they would never get passed down to future generations. Yeah, that's that's but, like the really scary thing is that if if there's some sort of maybe off target effect that you don't even know about, you know, it could pop up generations later, mm -hmm. um, and do you know horrible damage or, or yeah. cause you know some sort of crazy. You might inadvertently defect. you might inadvertently create a disease, or you might inadvertently create like superhuman like evolution. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's like, um, but are you really gonna roll that guy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, re I remember you were talking with Austin about the um, the Chinese like gene editing, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's you know it's obviously very very horrible to do something like that um, before getting the proper you know at least in the U.S. we have the FDA par paradigm where you have mm -hmm. to show in animal models that something is safe and that it's effective before you do a series of clinical trials and then yeah. you know you you actually take it to the clinic um but i'm so again i'm not at all in supportive of this research but i can i can sympathize a little bit mm -hmm. um because the goal of that is to you know prevent babies from getting like hiv passed on from mm -hmm. from their mothers during childbirth yeah and i i could imagine you know uh if i were having a child and i had hiv like I, I would probably do anything I could to like prevent you know my child from getting HIV mm -hmm. even though there's like I know that there's like prophylactic drugs out there like like mm -hmm. crap I mean I, I don't know how those yeah like they they've been around for a couple of years but they're yeah. still relatively new so they're yeah. probably still pretty expensive yeah is my guess but uh yeah it is a non GA way to prevent the passage of mm -hmm. the virus but I think that's the thing is like I feel like with enough time you could find multiple ways to prevent diseases. So, like, I'm always, like, is gene editing, like, it's the cool way to do it, mm -hmm. I guess, from some people's perspective. But it's, like, is it necessarily the only way or the best way? Like, that's kind of more the discussion. But I totally see where you're coming from. Yeah. It's, like, it's, how, how do you weigh, like, the danger with, like, what could potentially be? And, and it's easy for us to, like, sit back, you know, in, in our chairs and be, like, wow, this was, like, absolutely horrible. No one should gene edit babies. But I, I just... I, I want to note that I, I can feel a little sympathetic for, for mm -hmm. people who would who would elect to do that. Um, but, you know, oh, yeah. um, obviously it's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess going back more to like you guys' research, um, you're focusing particularly around the knee. Mm -hmm. um, is there any particular reason why you decided to go with that portion of the body as opposed to, you know, other portions? Um, well, I'm interested in the knee because it's really the, the locus... I guess you would say of osteoarthritis. Mm. So I think CDC numbers put uh, adults living with osteoarthritis around 25% of the population, which is insanely huge, um, you know, in the U.S. And so many people have knee problems. I'm sure um, 
you know, anyone can think of like their grandma, you know, or their grandpa, like having, having issues with their knees. Like even, even, you know, my dad has had an issue with his knee, uh, since as long as I can remember. Um, and, and a lot of the, the pain and debilitation and difficulty with life comes from that degeneration of knee cartilage. So if there were a good, you know, tissue engineering method to replace damaged cartilage and prevent the onset of osteoarthritis, I feel like uh, you could improve the quality of so many lives, um, you know, in the U.S. and worldwide. Mm -hmm. So what have you, like, I guess, what have you guys found is, like, the biggest hurdle for making that a reality? You know, I think our lab has come pretty far in engineering the actual tissue. I think our biggest hurdle right now is is showing um, efficacy in a large animal model. Funny, we were just talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, let's say we could go directly into humans. Yeah. We could give a human patient with like a cartilage defect, our tissue engineer product, and we can say, okay, we want you to lie in a bed and hold your knee still for one week while, while you heal from the surgery. And then I think, you know, our procedure would probably work. But before we do that, we have to tell the FDA that it's actually going to work. So we have to do it in an animal model. And we've tried using things like horses, uh, sheep, and right now we're focusing on the mini pig. But you can't tell a mini pig to lie in bed for a week and not move its leg. It's going to want to yeah. stand up and walk around, and it's going to damage that implant most likely. So uh, a lot of our recent focus has been on uh, kind of protecting the engineered implants, and uh, my current focus in the lab is working on getting it integrated into the surrounding native tissue uh, so that it won't fall out of place or kind of cause further degeneration to the joint. Mm, interesting. Okay. So yeah, that is an interesting problem because you're, can you just like sedate the pigs for like a week? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it would be pretty unethical to, to just sedate them for a week because yeah. they, um, and also, you know, a little bit of loading is good. Like we want, um, it, in humans, we would use a continuous passive motion machine. It's something that you put your leg into and it just kind of, I think, I think Ryan might've talked about this, but it kind of rotates back and forth and allows for a little bit of motion of the joint. Um, Apparently, our lab has tried using this in the past on sheep, and it, it was terrible. Right. Um, but you want a little bit of movement, so you can't sedate them. Also, you want them to be, you know, eating and, like, metabolically active and everything. Mm. Like, this has to be a living animal in right. order to, yeah. to kind of heal up, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess, ah, man, that's, like, a problem. That it it is a problem. Um, we're hoping that uh, the solution is... Uh, a really good splinting of the joint to prevent the animal from bearing any weight on it okay. um, at least until uh, it can start to bear a little bit of weight um, so we're, we're using actually kind of a classic veterinary uh, uh, splinting technique it's called the Thomas splint and we have animal surgeries coming up this month actually that we'll be using Thomas splints on uh, so I guess fingers crossed that we have good results with that okay are you doing that up in Davis or um, so we have uh, animals up at Davis and down at Irvine. There's um, the the University Hospital over in Orange um, has some animals, and then I guess the TMJ work is, is going up at Davis. Okay. Uh, but all the knee work, uh, I think, is happening uh, over in Orange. If you didn't know, you can find Talks with Toe on Spotify and Google Play, and coming soon to Apple Podcasts. Also, if you're more of a visual learner, we'll soon have video content on YouTube. Head over there and subscribe to Talks with Toe. And now, back to the show. Nice, nice. So, I guess, what is your end goal after a PhD? <laughs> after a PhD, um, I'm, I'm interested in academia because uh, I, I TA'd for the first time last spring and I absolutely loved it. Um, I mean, I, I kind of liked the idea of academia before that, but... Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of cemented the, uh, that future for me. Well, I don't want to say that too early, <laughs> but uh, that that kind of made made me confident yeah, that, that yeah. it was indeed. You what know, class were you uh, teaching for? It was uh, biomechanics, okay. uh, one ten C. One ten, okay. Yeah, um, and I I really love the interactions with the students. Um, they they made my day, and um, the the act of kind of passing on knowledge I think is is really. Um, is a really great career uh, for me. I think I would be able to do it effectively and I, I would find um, a lot of joy in that. I know that there are a lot of professors who are uh, 
like 95% on the research and like kind of teach on the side a little bit. Uh, but I would really like to be um, like one of those professors who, who is able to do mm -hmm. both the research and the teaching. Have you talked to Dr. Jean at all? Because like she's primarily teaching faculty. Yeah, I, like... I have to, I have talked to her a little bit. Um, actually, my, my lab mate Avelia was doing a um, like a mini fellowship with her for one of her classes, which was about improving uh, teaching strategies. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were using like the newer high tech classrooms. Yeah, the anteater learning pavilion. Yeah, yeah. I've never been in those classrooms. I've been in there uh, once or twice. They're pretty nice. Yeah. They're like, cause so it's like they're all desks like where you sit around the mm -hmm. desk, and then each desk has a TV mm -hmm. that you can either like I think like Apple drop or like Chrome drop to the TV, so yeah. that if students need to like use their laptop, they can just immediately throw stuff on the screen for the entire table to mm -hmm. see. Um, it's a really cool environment. Um, yeah, we, we had one of those at, at University of Michigan in my senior design class, um, but it, I think it really wasn't implemented well because kind of the instructor was in the middle trying to, to like lecture a little bit and then the students were all like kind of huddled around their own screens. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like these kind of alternate like learning environments uh, need to be or, or rather, the class material kind of needs to be catered to the learning environment um, so that, you know, people are actually using the TVs for what they're supposed to instead of, yeah. kind of like, facing away from the instructor. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's definitely a problem. I think, because I did, I did take one class in that, that room, and it was basically just a lecture class. Yeah. So we didn't use anything. Right, lect that lecture classes like, don't, don't work for that. Yeah. yeah, and, like, unfortunately, that's just how mm -hmm. most classes operate. Right. Um, it's kind of the classic teaching paradigm, right? The guy, right. guy with a lot of knowledge goes up in front of like all the students and then like talks for an hour. Yeah. And although it works for some people, it definitely doesn't work for everyone. <laughs> what, what would you prefer to do? Like if you're able to change <laughs> things? Well, I kind of got to lead my own discussion sections when mm -hmm. I was TAing and it, you know, it was the classical format. I mean, I, I was standing up um, in front of a whiteboard and I would, I would write things out. Uh, but I tried to encourage a lot of audience participation, so um, it was kind of an open discussion where if I would go through basically practice problems, but if anyone had a question about any of the previous homework uh, questions or anything like that, we would just go through it together as a class. Mm -hmm. um, so it, even though it was a traditional style, I feel like it was pretty effective. Yeah. Um, there's definitely uh, other ways of teaching that can be very effective too. Uh, I know that things like group work or um, kind of like games and stuff can, mm. can be really fun and engaging, um, at least in terms of biomechanics, because it was such kind of a, a structured class. Um, in that way, it, it was easier to just kind of go the traditional method. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm teaming for the senior design class right now. Mm -hmm. That's been interesting, because that's all basically group work the entire class. Mm -hmm. So what, what kind of stuff do you do like when you TA for that? So unfortunately, a lot of us is our our job as TAs is like feedback. So they'll have group assignments that the group assignments are intended to teach them how to address an engineering problem, meet an unmet clinical need, mm -hmm. and what how do you innovate and create solutions to those problems, right? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of our feedback is after the fact, right? So they do these projects, so they do these assignments as a group mm -hmm. and then we give them feedback on like this is maybe the good direction to go but you guys are like a little bit off or like no you shouldn't do that because that's not actually feasible right but, like you wouldn't know that because like you haven't been doing engineering stuff long enough right um but a lot of our interaction is like just through emails or like one-on-ones that mm -hmm. if they have issues they come to us yeah um because the problem with that class is that there's just too many teams mm -hmm. so Last year we had twenty one teams, so, um, between three TAs and three professors. Of which the three professors, like two of them, were incredibly busy with other stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so realistically, we had like four and like kind of five people trying to manage twenty one teams. This year we have more students. That's that's way too um, many. So we have one hundred sixty five students right now. We actually don't have enough seats in the lecture hall to f seat all the students. <laughs> So, like, That's we're all standing, like, the TAs and the, the professor are all standing to give, like, seats for the students to sit. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, yeah, like we're just over capacity. <laughs> I, I think my senior design class had eight teams. Yeah, and that that felt like a lot because we would there were days where we would like all present to each other and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, That's the thing is like when you're trying to do at the end of the quarter like presentations for all the teams. Mm-hmm. Each team basically has like eight minutes. Yeah, there's, there's like, no way you can do anything. In that it's time. like how do you explain an engineering topic in eight minutes? and like get across the point of like what you did and why it's effective like you can do it Mm -hmm. but also when you have a team of five or six people (laughs) i don't know if you could do it in eight minutes it's tough that's that is tough yeah so there's there's a lot of hurdles to academia teaching i think that are also kind of newer because at least at uci like we're getting a lot more students Mm -hmm. but we don't have the facilities or the faculty to keep right. up with that I think and and our university is uh, like expanding like crazy I mean yeah in terms of student body but I mean we're, we're constructing I think like new buildings and new dorms like yeah twice a year or something like that it's at least yeah. and that's happening at most of the UC campuses yeah, but, yeah I guess what do, you, what do you kind of see as like the role of academia in like broader society that's an interesting question <laughs> um, so I kind of have to follow um i guess the lead of my advisor yeah because um he kind of takes a different um approach to uh academic research and that's a huge focus on translation so uh i would obviously love to continue that um in my future career by translation i mean focusing on developing uh technologies in the academic lab that can be uh, used in clinical practice, you know, in, in real people. A lot of academic research, I feel, is so tied up with, you know, lab rats or, mm-hmm. you know, processing numbers on a, on a screen or whatever like that. But the end goal um, really should be, how is this going to be used to benefit humans as opposed to, like, how can I get this data to support my hypothesis, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's important, but it should be a means to an end. So... Um, when it comes to, I guess, my own academic research, I don't know if it's going to be in, in cartilage or, or bone or something else, but I would really like to be focusing on kind of similar stuff that I'm doing right now, which is uh, the end goal being large animal studies, uh, even potential, you know, companies started that, that can take it from that large animal study mm. uh, into the FDA paradigm of, you know, clinical trials and, and things like that. Yeah. Do you think the FDA is like, because the FDA, I think, is changing a lot of the ways going through approval process mm-hmm. right now. At least there's been a lot of talk about that, um, but it still takes an incredibly long time oh, it, to it get takes, things to yeah, the FDA. Very long. It can um, it can take over 10 years from something that's, you know, successful in the lab to, yeah. you know, be, be on the market. Yeah, and there's a lot of arguments about, like, the good, the pros and cons of that, right? Mm-hmm. Like... On one hand, we want that process because we don't want things happening like thalidomide or like, right. you know, like birth defects due to drugs and like that were not properly tested or things like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, like it does delay the ability for a lot of these technologies to get into a clinical setting and actually yeah. help people. So. I don't know, what is your perspective on well, that I, balance? I think a lot of the difficulty comes from the, the fact that the technology is accelerating way faster um, than the, the support for the technology, you know, from the government. So, I mean, there, there are cartilage, like, guidance documents where the FDA is telling us how to, like, kind of form our preclinical studies that were written in, like, the 70s. Mm-hmm. And um, there's, like, some newer stuff, but a lot of the, the really, like, modern guidance is is not there at all so we're we're kind of left alone to figure out um exactly how to approach our preclinical studies uh meaning like the the large animal studies that we're doing um it again as as you say it's difficult because if if you make the process too fast you you risk a lot yeah um and if you make the process too slow then you can risk people not getting the treatment that they need yeah that's Um, sad (laughs) yeah um I think when it comes to big governing bodies like the FDA, mm-hmm. um, you need to be really, really risk adverse because um, a small slip up like letting uh, a product through before it's been proven to be safe and efficacious uh, can, you know, kill people. Um, there was a very famous incident of 
um, Vitek Inc. They made something called a Proplast uh, TMJ disc. Mm-hmm. I'm not not sure if Ryan mentioned this in this interview. Yeah, I think he did. So uh, it was a Teflon um, TMJ replacement disc. So this this jaw uh, between you know in your mandible that that allows you to chew and talk. Um, basically, this Teflon would degrade after it was implanted into the body and release uh, you know Teflon in, into the surrounding tissues. Because your TMJ is so close to sensory organs, you know, like your eyes and your brain, um, this would cause like horrible problems. You know, I think over ten thousand people received this implant, and then they had like complete jaw degeneration. Um, people would also get like constant pain from like Teflon going into their nerves and stuff like that. And actually, a lot of people committed suicide. So um, it was basically this huge fault. Uh, from the FDA, like allowing this technology to be marketed. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously we don't think that any tissue engineered product that, that we make in the lab could do anything of that sort. Right, because that's kind of the point. You're trying to avoid some kind of Right, we're, we're trying to make something that's going to be as close to the native tissue as possible so that your body doesn't even, you know, recognize it as foreign. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the goal. But, you know, e- even though we trust our own product, we don't trust it to the degree that we're going to uh, put it into people before we've shown again that it's yeah both safe and efficacious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, there is a reason for everything because the thalidomide thing was also I don't know if you were familiar with it. Yeah, it, um, it was uh, like birth defects, right, caused by. Yeah, it was. So it was originally actually marketed in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, was the original market like where it started? It was a, a Euro- European product that was basically designed to help women when they were pregnant, like, get over morning sickness, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and it worked. Like, it would remove most of the symptoms from morning sickness. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time, they didn't have any, like, governing body in Europe that was nearly as significant as the FDA. Yeah. So, um, it was, in Europe, it was being used for, like, a couple of years, like, you know, five years or so, and then they were trying to market it in... United States, and there was actually just like one person in the FDA who saw this and was like, uh, I don't know about this, like, I think we should delay this in the United States. So like, the FDA was going to approve it, and then this one person in the FDA was like, no, nah, like, we, we should probably delay this. Mm-hmm. And thank God that she did, because like 10 years later, they started realizing that all these women had been taking thalidomide in Europe were giving birth to children had serious birth defects. Right. Um, and the number of cases in the U.S. were a lot smaller. It was, like, people who went to Europe and, like, got it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so, like, that's another example of, like, why the FDA is somewhat necessary, as slow as it can be sometimes, and as cumbersome as it is <laughs> to deal right. with in academia. Um, it's, it's funny yeah. that you, that you mention um, because th- there's one tissue engineered uh, knee cartilage product on the market there it's called macy so mm-hmm. matrix assisted autologous chondrocyte implantation it's a lot of words <laughs> so, yeah it's a lot of words um and they uh managed to get through the fda paradigm in the u.s because they had already implanted um you know their product into humans in, in i think it was europe it, it was mm-hmm. it was you know not in the u.s and they kind of used that data as uh, you know, support for their package in the U.S. Um, and they, so if you think about it, their process was kind of backwards. Yeah. Um, at least from the FDA's perspective, they had human data before they even did an animal study. And then their, their animal study was, was really strange. You can look at all like this public information, but it was, you know, a handful of horses that they, uh, used the product on. And I, I don't even remember what the results were, but I don't think they even mattered because, the FDA kind of passed them right through with, with the human trial data already available. I think it's kind of sketchy. It, it was really strange. And it's, I remember as a lab, we were looking um, for, like, through the FDA website for currently, you know, um, approved uh, biologics for, for knee cartilage. And yeah. the only one had not really gone through the FDA paradigm. So it was a PMA? It was a yeah. pre market approval? Yeah. Interesting. Um, there, there are eighteen. That's that usually are more rigorous, right? Yeah. Um, so the yeah, there's the one with the PMA, but there there are eighteen that are currently in development that we'll probably see over the next ten years. Okay. Um, maybe ours included. Oh, interesting. 
Are you, you guys would probably be filing under 510k, right? Um, or would you try to do PMA also? So we would we would probably have to do a, a PMA um, okay. because, and, and we've talked about this as a lab, and uh, depending on who's listening to this, they're going to be laughing at me because we've, we've <laughs> talked about this at length. Um, but there's, uh, you know, our, our device is considered a, a combination product because um, it's got, like, you know, living tissue, so it's biologic. Um, but then there's, uh, well, I guess it, it also actions at, at, sorry, it also is a device because it's it's an implanted, you know, product. Right. So, so is it, is it, would we consider class three? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's going to be class three. Yeah. And we were, we were trying to figure out, I guess, ways that we could uh, deal with, like, less rigorous uh, testing and stuff like that by trying to see if it could be, like, a minimally manipulated product, which would have it go through certain easier guidelines but um we basically have to put it through the ringer because it's uh yeah combination product we have to deal with different governing bodies in the fda that yeah. handle both biologics and devices and it's yeah yeah it's definitely a rigorous <laughs> process yeah so for people who are listening who are like may not be well versed in all the bureaucracy <laughs> of the fda um a, pre- a pma or a pre-market approval is kind of like the approval you get for a device that's like pretty much never existed before mm-hmm. or like something that is new and there's no precedent for it so there's nothing that is currently on the market that does the same thing right whereas a 510k is something that you're saying there is already an existing approved device by the fda and we have a new device that does something equivalent to that right okay. so you even like a, a tongue depressor is is a you know medical device right mm-hmm. but if you make a new tongue depressor that's like you know a millimeter thicker and it's like easier to hold or whatever you don't need to go through uh all of the rigorous testing and everything you can just say oh you know this is basically the same tongue depressor but it's a bit you know easier to whatever right and then, it, then it's you know kind of a simple process to get approved plus those things would be class one devices because uh, if you mishandle them or something, no one's going to die. Um, yeah. It'd be kind of hard to kill someone with a tongue depressor. Uh, but Although possible. <laughs> probably possible. <laughs> um, but when it comes to things that you can, like, implant in the body, especially things that, like, if, if they go wrong, they can cause, you know... Massive issues. Yeah, yeah. massive. Then, then you're looking at something that, that'll be classified as, like, class 3, which is the, the most rigorous classification. That's, that's our device. Yeah. Do you know what vaccines are considered? That's a good question. Are they maybe like class two? Class two. Because you can get um, reactions to them, but yeah. like very, very regular. But they're not. Um, they're in a non planted so. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. What's your perspective on the anti vax movement? <laughs> uh, it's it's just it's it's kind of depressing. Um, yeah. Because the, there were like measles outbreaks in Orange County, and just um, like yeah, that's like crazy. Yeah, like looking at the fact that kids are now like getting sick and like some are even dying right of, of measles that are completely preventable um is is really kind of sad yeah. um the the i think the anti-intellectualism kind of behind it um mm-hmm. is is pretty disheartening um a yeah. lot of people are willing to kind of get their scientific knowledge from like you, you know blogs on the internet as opposed to looking at you know peer-reviewed papers and I mean, yeah, but well, the thing is, like, you know, we're used to looking at scientific papers, but right. by and large, like, a majority of the population, like, isn't. So, like, how do you, like, convey that knowledge in a manner that is acceptable, but also still from a reputable source? Like, right. You, I think, um, I, I think there's some work to be done in making uh, science as a whole, like, a little bit more approachable probably um the reason that people are so willing to kind of take in thing i mean not even limited to like anti-vax but like you know climate change denial mm-hmm. or any other like anti-intellectual like you know followings like that is because um these people are, are able to make their arguments in a way that sounds really nice if you don't think about it too much and um you know the, the biomedical engineering that we work can sound really nice if you think about it a ton and if you, you know, read a ton of papers and dedicate a lot of time to it, but it doesn't sound nice in a little, you know, sound bite that, that someone can read and kind of understand instantly. Yeah. Um, 
So I think, uh, you know, as, as researchers, you know, you and I ought to be thinking of ways that we can describe our work in, in ways that are really open and like really accessible by people who are kind of outside the field, uh, especially if we want to convince people that they're important. Um, yeah, I think, I think part of it is that you have to assume everyone is capable of yeah. understanding your research, which I generally think that like for my research, like I think everyone I meet are like capable of understanding what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, like I might have to do a little bit more work to explain it, um, but that's more on me than on them, I think. And that's kind of like part of the issue I see is like a lot of the times I see that people in academia are kind of unwilling to change the way that they engage with people. Right. Um, and sometimes it is like they assume that like oh these people are just like like not capable of understanding like what I'm saying. I was like, well, like. Did you even try? Like, yeah, no, totally. <laughs> like um, you need to at least. <clears throat> you, there is a way that you could explain it. I think. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, because yeah. you you could like sit in on a lab meeting of like any random BME lab, and unless you know, um, like unless you have some solid background in what they're talking about, uh, there's going to be so much jargon and like you know so so much little technical details that's going to make sense to everyone in the room except for you. Um, and I think every PhD student probably feels like that, you know, the first time that, they, that they're that they in, like, a lab meeting. Um, and then they just kind of grow accustomed to it, and they get a lot more familiar with all the lingo and stuff like that. Um, but I think that it goes to show that people should, should work on how to uh, talk about their research, how to kind of sell it more, um, and, and make it seem more interesting in that way. Um, you know, maybe people will share on Facebook, like... <laughs> oh, look at this cool, you know, mass spec collagen subtyping method (laughs) instead of, oh, look at this, you know, blog that tells me I need to, like, eat collagen to, like, make my skin glow. Yeah, the internet's an interesting thing because, like, originally the internet was actually a DARPA project. I don't know if you know this, but, like... um, I've heard about that. Yeah. You might have told me that. The entire point of the internet was, like, so that scientists could communicate with mm-hmm. each other rapidly across like, the nation wasn't the first like instant chat from like sf to la or, or something it was like from that. stanford to ucla okay yeah. yeah um they didn't finish the message they like <laughs> crashed the computer like yeah. mid, mid message it was like text you know <laughs> so they're like all right we sent the h and they're like oh we got the h and then like you know we sent all you need <laughs> we, sent, we sent the we sent the e oh we got the e it was like and we sent the l i was like uh, we didn't get that. <laughs> so that was how the internet started, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but like, then it was opened up to everybody, right? Yeah. So originally, like, a lot of the information on the internet was like all scientifically based. Yeah. But as you allowed people to like open the internet and like, which we was a good thing, you know, because mm-hmm. that's how we got things like you know Google and Facebook and stuff like that. But yeah. but as you did that, you also let people put literally whatever they want on the internet. Um, which is now kind of an interesting situation because it's like right you need how do you parse information or how do you like tag information that people will trust mm-hmm. when it's like a disembodied like entity it's right just the internet right yeah you kind of have to you have to work it i think on an individual level um like each person for themselves kind of i think um people need to get really good at like building their their bs detector because there's you know so so much like you know stuff on the internet that's yeah like, how do you teach people how to bs detector? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, apparently so okay i did see one paper about this about like the the bs vaccine mm-hmm. where if you feed people like little um small bits of knowledge that are like that are bs and you tell them they can start to, to catch on um, and kind of resist the, the mass amounts mm. that that are so prevalent today. Um, it's probably more effective if you start that earlier too, huh? Yeah, I, honestly, like, I think education is, is a good way to go about it. Like, online literacy would be a wonderful, like, middle school level class. Yeah. Like, te- teach people how to research subjects um, beyond yeah. just, like, Googling it and clicking, like, the first two results. Honestly, I think that coding is going to become a class like English pretty soon. Um, my my yeah. high school offered um, offered computer science uh, mm-hmm. when when I was there, yeah. and 
but like when we were going through school like you know computer science was like more of an elective class right? like yeah most, so like the people who took that class were the people who were like it was the nerds <laughs> yeah it was like the nerds <laughs> the that people class, who really yeah. wanted to come but yeah. yeah yeah including it as more of a standard curriculum i think would be really cool yeah because i think a lot of people nowadays like they use all these apps and they like understand that the internet is there and that someone does coding somehow but they don't really see the behind the scenes mm-hmm. so there's a lot of like lost understanding of like how things are changed yeah. and manipulated and and um learning to code even a little bit teaches you i think really important skills um mainly algorithm or algorithmic thinking so instead of like thinking of you know the problem like two plus three like also thinking of, about it as like two plus one plus one plus one um like just little things like that i think early on in education can can really help out um i i remember when i was in i think sixth grade um my friend and i taught ourselves how to program like those ti-83 calculators oh yeah, uh, yeah that had that like that that ti basic programming language on them and that um like just that process of, of learning a programming language kind of from scratch and, and, you know, like making games and making Mm -hmm. like, um, equation solvers and things like that, uh, is like a huge reason of why I'm in engineering right now. Yeah. Um, Because it really developed kind of those algorithmic, uh, thinking uh, skills. What's kind of interesting is that like, as I'm been teaming, this is the second time I'm teaming the senior design class, like the number one question I get from most students is like, how do I start learning to code? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I just like, (laughs) <laughs> have to take a deep breath and be like, man, <laughs> like, this is your senior year at college and yeah. you're trying to learn how to code now. Like, it's possible. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong, it's possible, but like, I think our education system is kind of doing a disservice to people who are in engineering majors in college mm-hmm. and they've gone through four years of college and they still don't really have a fundamental, fundamental basis of like how these computer systems work because, like, mm-hmm. Nowadays, like, you can't do anything without a computer. Right. Like, at least when I was going to college, like, people still kind of took notes, like, mm-hmm. on paper. And, like, a lot of people still try to do that. But, like, as I've gone through, like, TAing, that's becoming less and less common. Like, most people are on their computers yeah. and, like, taking notes on their computer. Um, I, I made it through all four years of undergrad without a laptop, and I pride myself on that, but I think I was, like, the only person I knew. Right. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, like, hand note-taking, um, but, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I was resisting the, the wave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it's definitely, like, you look at any electric hall now, there's just laptops out. Yeah. Which... Um, yeah. which can be really effective. Uh, the reason that I wanted to avoid it is because I, I noticed, like, I remember freshman year of undergrad sitting in, like, a huge lecture hall. Everyone had their laptops out, you know, for, like, for note-taking, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, like, half, half of them are on Facebook. <laughs> I, I remember sitting in, a, it was a class called, like, Bio 171. We were learning about, like, the genome. And I was distracted by someone in front of me who was buying, like, a $1,000 worth of shoes during lecture. And, like... How, like, first of all... It's not even good for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know. I'm like, you're distracting me, but also, that's so much money <laughs> to spend on shoes in a bio class. Do people go crazy over sneakers? Like, <laughs> I never really understood the appeal. I'm just like, you know, if it works. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I had a friend in college, actually, he would buy and resell shoes. Uh-huh. So he would like you know buy the Yeezys or like oh, man. you know the Air Jordans and okay. resell them for profit. You you so, asked me what the biggest difference was between like Michigan and California. It's how many people wear expensive like shoes out here. Really? I like okay when um I'm not like a super huge sneakerhead or anything, but like yeah. I I I know what like Yeezys look like, and I swear like half the people out here are wearing Yeezys. <laughs> They're probably all knockoffs, but like yeah. um <laughs> but like if if you walk around like college campus and like Ann Arbor it's like you'll probably see one or two but not to the degree that you see out here yeah I think Southern California is a little bit more image conscious yeah I think like most people growing up here don't realize that but like Mm -hmm. when you once you travel around it's like yeah people are very image conscious in Mm -hmm. Southern California and like it kind of is partly due to LA and like Hollywood you know yeah um but it's also just like the California thing a lot of it's pretty superficial but right it, it is definitely embedded in the culture i would say i I love that sign um on the pch down 
by Newport. It's like nine dollar Botox. <laughs> it's like wow. <laughs> Yeah, That's advertising is a... It's a good deal. It's even worse in West Hollywood, dude. You go to yeah. West Hollywood and it's just like... Man, some of those billboards are just like, I don't know <laughs> like, why this is up. Yeah. It is. So. So, I don't know. <laughs> Obsessing with, with appearances is... I don't know. It's it's not for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe it's just because we're engineers. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we, we, don't, we don't need to look good. Yeah, I guess now that you've been in grad school for a while, like, what are some of the pros and cons you've seen of the way graduate programs are right now, or just like you know your experience in grad school? Um, well, I I would say uh, being in this PhD program has given me like um, kind of the the depth of knowledge of of my field to a degree that I I don't think I could get like anywhere else. Um, which is which is really really good, right? People say like in undergrad you kind of build you know your your sphere of knowledge, and then once you go into grad school you take like a direction and you go like super deep into that, um, and I think that that can be like really like really fascinating. Um, I think I I approach um, kind of the things a little bit differently. Like I I tend to not. Um, stress out as much over over like academics and exams and things like that i think we're pretty similar yeah um, Yeah. i also i try to not like kill myself with work in the lab um like and i mean that's nice to say it's not always possible right there's gonna be like weekends and nights that you have to work sometimes but if i'm if i'm like having just way too much stuff to do sometimes I'll, i'll try to like take a little break and kind of like refocus um and and try to work through it instead of you know crumbling over the the tower of stuff to do this there's, there's always the tower of stuff to do yeah yeah <laughs> but i try i try to you know try to act like i'm gonna tackle it instead of just cowering yeah well, what are your what are kind of your methods of doing that you're handling that um so let's see i'll i'll try to at least when i get home from lab if i don't have anything to do that night i try to just just not worry about it constantly so i'll you know i'll get home and like you know, cook dinner, and I'll be, you know, talking with my fiance Elise, and, like, we'll be hanging out, like, mm-hmm. watching TV, and there's sometimes a little thing in the back of the mind that's, like, you've got, like, five papers to write, <laughs> and I'm, like, fuck, shut up, go away, <laughs> but, um, just, just trying to focus kind of on the moments, um, yeah. and other things, um, taking care of, like, you know, physical and mental health, I feel, is, is super important, um, they, I think they kind of go hand, hand in hand, too, um, if you're like if yeah. you're active and you're you know kind of do, doing things that you enjoy like sticking with some hobbies things like that um, if you have the time it yeah, it's crazy good. how easy it is to realize like oh dude I haven't exercised in like a couple of days oh, so I've yeah. just been doing research for like forever yeah it's it's awful <laughs> and, and well sometimes a couple of days turns into a couple of weeks and yeah. yeah it's it's rough um, and and you know we're as grad students we're always going to be like juggling a lot of balls right and sometimes like one of them drops and um it, it happens but you, you try to kind of pick yourself up and, and yeah. go along yeah i've been trying to go rock climbing more so mm-hmm. yeah austin bailed on me dude <laughs> Just kidding. I, you know i here's me shouting out austin for for like we we were workout buddies like really solid for a while and then mm-hmm. it just it all it all went away and and I'm gonna blame him for it. <laughs> it's like totally my fault, but I but I'm gonna blame him for it. Yeah, Austin, you're the reason I'm out of shape. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you if you are interested in climbing, you know, it's a good way to it's a fun way to do it. I think, uh-huh. but that's what I found. It's I try to run once in a while still, mm-hmm. but that's been more difficult recently. Um, yeah because that's kind of my, been up my go-to but yeah mm-hmm. um and then i guess the last thing which might not work for everybody is um taking like a, a very kind of non-emotional um aspect to uh some of like the the bigger stressors like in in your life so for example i have like my qualifying exam coming up mm-hmm. um actually in about a month and um at least if it's anything like the prelims, I know that before the qualifying exam, everyone's going to be like, you know, stressing out and like trying to pack as much stuff 
as they can into their proposals and presentations mm -hmm. and like practicing last minute and everything like that. Um, and this, this is going to sound like almost robotic, but I, I see like stressing out, um, about something like that, uh, to, to be non-productive because the more I stress out about it, kind of the less efficiently I'm going to work. So, um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, and it, it's a lot easier said than done, obviously. But if you're like, oh my god, I have so much to do, like it's due, you know, in, in two weeks, and I've got to mm -hmm. get everything going, it's like, you know, you, you just, um, you say, well, I have to do this, and I'm going to go get it done, and you, you work on it, yeah. like, you know, one section I think the coding, the coding aspect actually helps with that. Yeah, I'm probably. I'm kind of back, because you... You have to learn how to break down big problems and the small problems when yeah, you're coding, exactly. and you're like always, like working on small pieces to build, right. like build the whole right. And I think you know with any task, that's really the best way to approach things. Mm -hmm. It's like you have a monolithic task in front of you, mm -hmm. like let's say like the PhD in general. Yeah, you can spend your time worrying about the monolithic task, or you can identify like the small tasks that eventually become the completion of the full mm -hmm. task, right? So that's kind of how I approach things too. And I'm sure like, like you said, it's definitely way harder to do than <laughs> just saying you can do it. But um, yeah, it's helpful. Um, I, I saw a great um, post, I think on, on Reddit from like, there's this little girl who was telling her mom, like, you know, I, I want to be an astronaut, like when I grow up. Mm -hmm. And the mom's like, well, you got to go to, you got to get a college degree, you got to go to grad school, and you got to, like, pass a physical fitness exam, and, like, it's, it's like, it's really tough, and the girl's like, that's only three things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you can, if you can look at it from that perspective, you yeah. know. You know, kids have lots of teachers, so. It's like, you know, I got to publish, like, this paper, and then I got to, like, do my QE, and then I've got to, like, do my, uh, like, write my thesis, and I've got to defend it. It's four things, you know. <laughs> Why not? Um, but yeah, totally a approaching it like like a like a coding problem where you're like, okay, um, so here's the overall goal. But before I do that, I need to do like this method or like this function. Mm -hmm. So like, let me work on that for a while. Like, let me get that thing down, and then okay. So uh, the next thing I have to do is like I don't know, like write write my specific games. So let me let me write those down. Okay, now that I have my specific games, I can like, you know, continue on with the proposal or something like yeah. that. Um, it's, it's definitely a good way of, of approaching things. And I, I always have, um, I use a bunch of sticky notes, like, at my desk in the okay, office. Sticky note guy. <laughs> I, well, uh, I, I used to not be a sticky note guy. Now I'm kind of a sticky note guy. <laughs> um, but usually at the beginning of the week, I'll, I'll think about uh, what I'm going to do um, in lab, like, experimentally this week. Um, like what I'm going to do bench top, what I'm going to do, um, like writing wise, what I'm going to, uh, do publication wise. And then I'll, I'll kind of write down what I want to get done and then crossing those items off. Um, as, as I go through is kind of like a, a mini victory, yeah. you know, on my way. Yeah. Thanks. Well, we covered a lot. Um, you got any plugs, like where can people find you or your work or whatever <laughs> i'm like i'm not on social media so don't look for me yeah that's probably better, <laughs> better for your mental health anyways <laughs> uh shout outs to gaston's dog leela for being super cute <laughs> <laughs> nice shout out shout out to dog she's a golden retriever right? she's a golden retriever she's, she's nice amazing nice well yeah thank you for your time <laughs> thank you yeah. thanks for tuning into this podcast make sure to like and subscribe talks with toe is written and produced by chris toe to find out more about the NBLIF and the work that he's doing, visit the Delta I website at sites.uci.edu slash Delta I. That's sites.uci.edu slash D-E-L-T-A-I. Music is by Purple Planet. You can visit their website at purple-planet.com.